we take a look at Auburn's 2025 recruiting class on this edition of the Uptempo Podcast. You are now listening to the War Report Podcast Network. Let's go. What's up, Auburn family? I hope everybody's had a good week, man. I'm your host, Dustin Smith. Joined as always with my guy, Blake Lane. And Blake, we have a special guest tonight. You want to introduce the people to our guy? Yeah, man. Deuce the Scoop from over at 247, covering the Auburn Tigers. Glad to have him. Second time on the show with us. Dukes, how you doing tonight, man? Man, I'm good, man. Thank you guys for having me, man. It's always a good time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, man. We love we love getting you on, brother, and talking some recruiting. I want to hop right into it, man. Last time we talked to you, we talked about uh, we were right there on the cusp of this early sign of day, closing out the Auburn class. Before we get into the 2025 class, I just want to get your overall thoughts on the job that Hugh Freeze and the company did. Bringing in a top 10 class, I think that over on 24-7, y'all have them at uh, eighth overall. So, mm-hmm. And really, when you look at those teams in the top 10, Dukes, they're all teams that have proof of concept, right? They're all teams that are winning games. Auburn, the only team in there with a losing record. So I think that kind of speaks to the, the, the recruiting chops that this staff have. So speak to the job this this, uh, this staff did in their first year on the Plains. Yeah, I think they did an amazing job kind of just picking up um, a situation that could have went way worse after the harsher regime. Um, I think get, I think the number one thing that they did was to be consistent on getting in on guys earlier and taking it through the duration of recruiting, not giving up on guys. Um, so a lot of coaches do what they call – they have a term what they use when it goes to recruiting guys who they don't think they can get, and they call it practicing. And I think uh, last year guys were like, I'm not going to recruit that guy because I don't feel like practicing. Or, hey, does that guy really want to come, come to Auburn or am I practicing? I didn't hear practicing one time this year. Everybody that they recruited, they thought they could get. So uh, mm-hmm. I think they really just changing the mindset when it comes to – how Auburn is viewed amongst top recruits. I think they did a great job of changing that and uh, getting the culture to be in a place where Auburn is more of a destination, not just a place that you go when you can't go to Alabama or Georgia. Right. One thing that kind of led to this special class was Auburn getting Walker White early, right? And then him recruiting. We saw from the time he committed, he said, hey, I want these guys all the way to games towards the end of the season. He had jackets of guys that he wanted to get into the class. And by the way, he got a lot of those guys that he wanted. Um, But as we sit here now, Duke's kind of looking at 2025. Who are some guys that were looking at at quarterback and kind of getting a feel from the staff? How important do you think they think it is to go ahead and get that guy in here pretty, pretty quick so he can kind of do the same thing that Walker did in the 24 class? I think as uh, they've now introduced uh, Kent Montgomery, is that his name? Kent Austin, Kent Austin. Yeah, Kent Austin. As the QB, uh, coach. Quarter, QB coach. He and now that Philip Montgomery is gone, you're going to see the board change up a lot. I talked to uh, – Ryan Montgomery out of the uh, four star out of Finley, Ohio, I think, um, who Auburn was, uh, who visited Auburn multiple times last year. He said as a mutual parting of ways, his guy was Montgomery. So what that lets me know is that and he's being recruited by Georgia. He was at Georgia this weekend. He's being recruited by a lot of teams. But what it's telling me is that Austin is going to have his guys. I know that uh, Antoine Hill out of Houston County in Georgia, somebody that Auburn will be, continue to recruit. Uh, there's a guy by the name of T.J. Latif in California that Auburn seems to like. Um, I also think – I think you'll still see them re- uh, recruit K.J. Lacey. Um, I think a lot of time – I think a lot of that people thought was just – we're just recruiting Lacey just to try to get Ryan Williams. But I think you'll continue to see them recruit uh, K.J. Lacey. Um, and I think it is important to go ahead and get your trigger man early. I don't think it's as important as it was last year. Uh, just based on having to have somebody to be willing to step out in front of the entire recruiting class and say, hey, this is a place where top guys want to go. So you kind of got that role, and I think they're going to take their time and get the right guy, uh, somebody they think that can play and uh, could really kind of solidify Auburn's quarterback depth because when you look at the depth last year, you really didn't have it. Next year, you really got Walker White and the same thing you had last year, maybe a little less if you take uh, Robbie Ashford out of the mix. So I think that getting a real solid guy to the point where you're recruiting multiple guys, not, you know, like, could you have seen Auburn take two quarterbacks last year, right? Uh, Like, similar to what Ohio State did or what Alabama was trying to do or what Georgia was doing up until Rayola flipped. 
Like bringing the more guys you bring in, the more competition it breeds. And if somebody chooses to leave, that's on them. But you're going to make sure that Auburn is in the best hands possible for having a trigger man to lead the football team. What you got, Blake? Uh, Dukes, I just wanted to say, like, the K.J. Lacey thing, I know everybody was saying they're just trying to get him on board. That could get Ryan on board. Do you think that that – there still is a possibility because it kind of seemed like the smoke died down on KJ Lacey and then Alabama made a really tough push there. And then you still got Sark out at Texas and they're still recruiting him pretty hard. So is there a big chance for KJ Lacey and what is the smoke behind Juju Lewis? Yeah, I don't see it as a huge chance. I see it as more so of you'll see how the board shakes out. I think they do want somebody with some mobility, uh, that you can run some of those. Uh, if you look at some of those read option concepts that they ran last year, having a guy who could actually take it to the crib made much, it made much more of an impact as far as those games where you couldn't throw the ball. You could at least run the ball. Like you saw how they ran the ball with the quarterback and it kept you in the game against number one, Georgia at the time. Uh, Juju, I think there's some real smoke there. Uh, I think Juju is, that's one of those things that you just you got to recruit a guy who says I'm willing to visit. Like yeah. um you got to recruit him he's committed to, he's committed to Southern Cal. I I for one don't think he makes it out there. I'm not mm-hmm. saying he won't, but uh what I I think it'll come down to Auburn, Georgia. And another thing about Juju is you have to be set up culture-wise to deal with the circus that comes along with a quarterback like that. Um if you notice uh there hasn't been a more talked about quarterback in the nation over the past two years than Juju Lewis. And now he's not even the number one court. Well, ESPN has him ranked number number one in this class. But last year, uh, there were some people that had him ranked as the number one quarterback, regardless of class. Uh, when he came to his visit, he had a cameraman. I mean, there are things that you have to prepare yourself for when you get, when you recruit a Juju Lewis. So I think even stepping into that fray, getting that visit is something that you have to do to let guys know that we're serious about being the best team in the country and we're going to recruit the best players regardless this isn't your same old Auburn. How important when you're looking at some of these quarterbacks, Duke, is it to have all of a sudden a Perry Thompson, a Cam Coleman, a Bryce Kane, this fantastic receiving class that we just brought in to say, hey, you got these guys to throw to. Yeah, absolutely. It's almost like, I mean, there's certain places that you go, you want to know who's there, right? Um there, if you go to a club at night, back in our college days, we wanted to go to a club. We wanted to know who was there. Like, am I going there with the librarians or I'm going with the hot chicks? Like, you want to go somewhere where you know you feel like people are there are, are the same ilk or higher up than you to help you be at your best. Like, so let's say, <laughs> let's say you go you go to the club with the librarians. What are your chances are? You know, do you want to go read books later on? No, that's not what I'm trying to do. Trying to win championships, then you want those championship you're guys trying to around. Score, you. baby. You're trying to score. <laughs> you feel yeah. me? Right. We're trying to get in that end zone. We won't sit. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. You feel me? Yeah, we're trying trying to go, trying to go there with it. So you know <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> so now when you think about it, man, I think the people that are around you, especially the battery when it comes to quarterback or wide receiver, you it, you cannot undermine its importance because it's just it they're they're and I think it's going to help Auburn tremendously especially if Peyton Thorne has a better year. If mm. Peyton Thorne has a better year this year, then I think that you will get any, you can get any quarterback in the country to come play with those two receivers. What about Caleb Cunningham, uh, Caleb Cunningham Dukes? Uh, I know he said he enjoyed Auburn and, and it felt like family, and he was uh, really pleased with how they just keep coming at him. Well, what's the smoke there? I mean, now that you have more of a Mississippi flavor on your uh, on the offensive side of the ball, with uh, Derek Nix coming over as offensive coordinator, who was the wide receivers uh, coach there, but also had a really big influence on what they did recruiting wise at Ole Miss. He's been there for years. Uh, he's recruited that high school multiple times. Right now, they got him at Mississippi State, which I think that they got him uh, crystal ball to Mississippi State, or they're the presumed leader. But I don't. I think that uh, if you see Auburn take this turn this year. I think you have a really, really good chance of getting a guy like Caleb Cunningham, especially if you're able to see uh, Perry Thompson be successful or Cam Coleman be successful. Early on, I think it really bodes well for Auburn and trying to recruit who make the guy who I think is probably the best receiver in the country this year. 
Yeah, before we before we start recording, Dukes, I actually was watching some of his highlight tapes, and boy, that it's it's unbelievable, bro. It it really is. It just pops. It uh, it, it kind of looks like the Cam Coleman and Ryan Williams tape, where it's just like, oh, this is elite. This is the next level. But right. you can have all these skill make, skill players, bro. You can have all the quarterbacks that you want. It's not gonna matter, Dukes, if they don't have time to throw, and if you don't have a running game to complement it. Uh, we all know that the 2024 class, just in general, right, in the South was was pretty thin looking at the offensive line, way more thin than it is usually, but kind of beats back up here in the 25 cycle. We do have Spencer Dowling committed already, and we're hearing names like DeBose and Michael Waldrop, these are Matt Waldrop, excuse me, from Phoenix City. These kind of names coming up, pop, you know, popping. Just can you give us a number of, of guys you would expect Auburn to sign? And can you talk about Spencer Dowling a little bit, uh, the player out of Athens, just kind of what Auburn, what Auburn's getting there? Yeah, I think uh well first I think you'll get I think you'll see them sign no less than six six guys, mm, possibly seven. Like you can that. get that many. Um just because the sheer depth of the class. Um, I think when you when you think about a guy like Spencer Dowling, a hard worker, uh a, more of a technical guy, less raw, really refined, somebody who can come in. Now I wouldn't I'm not I wouldn't say he's as college ready as a Connor Lou. With somebody in that same type of form where they got the fundamentals down, they are they they are they don't need a whole lot of help with their kick step. Just a guy who's really really technically sound at his age, and as he's able to physically develop, you'll see him become one of those guys who can be a front line starter in the SEC. When you think about guys like, so if you take a guy like that, you can go and take uh, Tavares Dice from Langston Hughes, who may be more raw, but physically he's probably one of the best looking offensive tackle prospects you've seen in a while. He uh, compares very favorably to uh, Laramie Tunsil, a guy who, I mean, he's a 285 pound guy with a six pack, like one of those types. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Nah, he's tough. Uh, Dontrell Glover, they're really high on who uh, the former Alabama commit whose Mm -hmm. teammates with uh, TJ Dice, they want to play together. And uh, you know, I I hear from them pretty often. Auburn is really high on their list. You pull those two out, maybe you go get a more of a, a, a big, big guy like a, a Juan Gaston at Westlake in Atlanta is really high on their board. They haven't been able to make any inroads right now. I think they'll continue to uh, chop wood there. But then you go look at a Braden Jacobs, who's that same profile, uh, the son of Brandon Jacobs, 6'7", 320, uh, pro- maybe closer to 330 when I see him. Um, and right now he's outside. I mean, today, uh, they're outside. If you look at Brandon Jacobs, Brandon Jacobs, Instagram, they're outside doing drills today. Uh, his number one goal when I talked to, uh, Brandon was that he wanted to get that shape. He wanted to cut some of that baby fat off of Brandon so he can get to his most athletic level. When you think about those guys, a Michael DeBose, you think about a Josh Petty in Atlanta. I mean, there are so many guys in a 25 class that, once you once you get through that first elite range, you're still probably pulling guys who would have been like a three star in this year's offensive line class was a four star last year. So yeah, I think uh, with the depth there, I think uh, Auburn to be set themselves up really well, and I can I can really see them going after six or seven. Dukes, uh, Micah Debose is from down here where I'm at and everything, and I know Ryan Day was just here I think last Friday night watching him play basketball and. Uh, Athletic kid, man, athletic kid. Uh, he pinned somebody, uh, and Ryan Day just had a nice little reaction about it. Uh, you know, he decommitted from Georgia, and Georgia still says they're hard on him. Alabama and DeBoer coming in hard on him. Do you think Auburn can really hold Ohio State, Alabama, and Georgia off and keep that kid at home? Yeah, I think they can. I think it's really important that you put that – you get that uh, that mobile area back under Auburn control. I think any time that you've seen Auburn be really good, you've had a star player from Mobile, you've had a guy from Montgomery, you had a guy from Birmingham, and you had guys from Georgia, and last but not least, you've you've had Florida guys, especially at the skill positions. So when you get that five piece mix going, that's when Auburn has always been at their best. And that, but you cannot do it without Mobile, which may be the, if not the second most, is maybe the most important up area in Alabama when you look at the sheer talent and the type of guys that come out of there. I think the Bose and it is I think is the Bose at Viger. Yeah. Viger. Yeah, you yeah. got to get back in Viger. Every two to three years you see one of those guys who's like, oh my God, he's one of those. Like, you know, yeah. so I think I think they can. I think one thing about it, Auburn's going to compete NIL. Uh there's the opportunity to play early, definitely. And you know that Auburn is still going to be a run first pass second team. 
So they want to set up the pass off of the run. And I think that's attractive to offensive linemen who want to get their pancakes because a lot of times in pass pro, you're not going to get those highlight plays. But when you're in the run game and you have the opportunities to get out in front of people when you're running power, when you're able to pull, those are the type of things that entice offensive linemen. And I think that uh, getting to the second level is something that Auburn does well when they do have the athleticism at those positions. So I think that will be really enticing for uh, Michael DeBose. And I think they'll do a good job. Um, I think he's got to be priority one on their board, though. Good Blake, stuff. remaining in my questions are defense. I know you had a question about running back before we get over there. Yeah, I just wanted to say, Dukes, with everything, you know, Caddy leaving and Derek Nix coming in, uh, a lot of people were questioning where did Alvin Henderson sit. Uh, we know how close he was to Caddy. Can Derek Nix come in and rekindle that relationship and keep Alvin Henderson on the Auburn track? Yeah, I think he can. Um, I think he he recruited him, had some familiarity when he was at Ole Miss. Uh, I think a lot of schools uh, checked in and felt like he may have been an Auburn lock early on. So now seeing that window of opportunity for Derek Nix to come in and make that uh, tr- kind of make that relationship go a little bit, uh, show the care. Uh, I think him, I think he, Jeremy Garrett, uh, uh, Hugh, and one more, I think maybe Marcus Davis or somebody, uh, they were at his school last week, uh, earlier this week, I believe. And I think having that type of show of solidarity when it comes to recruiting a guy like that, letting him know that he is still priority number one, uh, I think that's super important. And I also think that Auburn will do a good job as far as, hey, look, we want to take another guy, but you are the guy. None of that has changed. Uh, You haven't changed. We haven't changed. And I think that Auburn is still going to be in the mix very, very heavily for Alvin Henderson. And uh, just to be honest, man, like, no matter what happened with Cadillac, he's still Auburn, still blue and orange. So I think that even if he were to reach out to Cadillac, he would still give a favorable opinion about a kid who really wanted to go to Auburn. Love that. Yes, sir. Before we let you get out of here, Dukes, I have some questions real quick about D-line. Um, you talk about Auburn getting in that Mobile area, man. Antonio Coleman and set out of Sarah Land, 6'2", 285-pound. Um, what is Auburn getting there? And then I'm looking at this class, man, and you've already got a majority of these commitments are down there on the D-line. Jeremy, Gary, Jeremy Garrett, excuse me, putting in work. Just kind of talk about the, do- the job that he's doing. And uh, can we expect uh, maybe one or two more commitments down there in the D-line? Yeah, I think with Antonio Coleman, you're getting a guy who's going to be really solid and setting the edge. You can play them at multiple positions up and down the defensive line. So if Auburn wants to go more so in the 3-3-5 with the fourth guy being more of a pass rusher, you can put him in any of those three techniques, any of those techniques. You can put him at the four eye if you need to. If you want to go four, you want to put him at the zero. He has that type of girth where he can hold at the point of attack and pass rushing situations. So a very versatile and strong guy. You look at his base. He's not a guy who's going to be moved easily off the ball, and he does have enough explosion in order to get to the quarterback in those certain situations. So I think they got a really, really good ball player in Antonio Coleman. And uh, Garrett wanted to make sure that he set the foundation of the defense along the defensive line. When he came in, all he ever heard about was how good Auburn was in the secondary, how good they were in the secondary. And uh, he was like, well, they're good in the secondary, but they can be great if we're good up front. And I think he really took to that uh, that mantra. And every time I talk to him, uh, even if he if he's in Atlanta or he's in Mississippi, he's always really excited about needing somebody. It's never, oh, man, I like that kid. It's I need that kid. And, they, and that kind of bleeds through the recruitment, and that's probably why you've seen – Auburn have the majority of their commitments be along the defensive line in the 25 class mm. because he takes that attitude with him everywhere he goes. And it, and it's almost like by osmosis, the high school coaches believe it. And they're willing to give their blessing to a guy who feels like they need a guy and they're not more so of a, a want or or a luxury. Good stuff. Blake, you got anything else, brother? I know we got the one yes. question we got to get to from our member, Michael. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, throw this last one in here. Ja'Kayla Falk uh, just throwing around some cryptic tweets and everything and uh, he's visiting Florida State, I believe, this weekend. Uh, you know, I, I I hope we don't lose him, but do you think that there is a chance he possibly could go to a Florida State or somewhere else besides Auburn? All right, I want to say this in the most respectful way. Um, anytime that you're dealing with a faith-based family, you never know what's going to happen. And I say that because money won't matter. Coaching staff won't matter. If they feel like they're going to pray the night before, 
and make their decision, then it's basically like, you know, they, they getting it from God. <laughs> like, so yeah. like I would never touch a crystal ball on nobody who I know mm-hmm. is saying, like, hey man, this is a faith-based decision. God is 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 one thousand percent in control. And and a lot of guys say it in a cool way. That family believes it. You better mm-hmm. one thousand percent know that when Keldra Falk decided to flip to Auburn, that was a prayer closet family. Hey, you hey, it, probably like a good Sunday evening Baptist service, mm-hmm. preachers sweating, mm-hmm. women shouting, fan fanning, all of that. So uh <laughs> no, nah, so I, when I say that, I'm like, yeah, man, I wouldn't um I wouldn't rule anything out, but I do think he wants to play with his brother. So that, right. that's what that's the most I'll put on that. But yeah, like because nobody from Florida State thought that he was gonna flip the Auburn. Nobody oh, did. So yeah, we'll see. Yeah, well, that kid, uh, he's a beast just like his brother, man. So we, yeah. uh, if we can if we can team them up, uh, and just just stay home. Your mama don't have to go too far. You don't want to go. Yeah. And, and Deuce, Deuce, I say it all the time. It's Tyler Nasty. We call it Tyler Nasty here for a reason, bro. You don't want to you don't want to spend any time in Tyler Nasty if you don't have to. You want to be over here on the other side of the A five up where the beaches are white. Um, right. Before, before we get out of here, man, uh, we did have a me- uh, question from our member Michael. Michael wanted to know. Of these three guys, who do you think could be uh, would commit to Auburn next, or if any of them? Right, Michael Debose, Alvin Henderson, or Eric Winters? Eric Winters. Mm. I think Eric, Eric Winters. Winters. Is, I think he's the um, he's the most likely of them uh, as far as the relationship, uh, the position of need, uh, the best blend of the relationship, position of need, and proximity. I think that's the he has the best blend of those three. Um, of course, the biggest position to need would probably be uh the boast, but as far as proximity and some of the other factors, uh, I'm not sure if he would be as close to and then you got to look. Uh, Michael the is, is, I mean, no, no slight to Eric Winters, but I think as far as a priority recruit, you go after guys who can protect the quarterback first, right? So, I think as far as somebody to, to commit early and want to be a part of what's going on. And especially how much how bad he's needed at that linebacker position, I think that Eric Winters probably of those three would be the most likely to commit next. Love that, love that. Well, Dukes, man, before you get out of here, tell people where they can find you and keep up with your brother. Uh, check me out on Twitter and Instagram at oh, not Twitter X, formerly known as Twitter. We still call it Twitter, baby. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> check me out on Twitter at Dukes the Scoop D U K E S T H E S C O O P and Instagram at the same handle. And be looking for some big news coming soon. Mm. Yep, yep. So got, I gave my guys a little inside info. So, yeah, check out yeah. for some big news in the next week. Yes, sir. We can't wait for that, man. Y'all go follow the Dukes. We will be back Sunday at 3 p.m. We're out. We love each and every one of y'all. War Damn Eagle. War Damn, baby. <laughs>